Welcome everybody. This is QuickBooks. Uh, this is QB Power Hour with QuickBooks at Year End Part Two, January twenty second. Uh, Michelle Long and Hector Garcia, myself, yours truly, uh, run this webinar series. Michelle Long could not be with us today. She's an author in the QuickBooks world. She has many books at Amazon. Ch check them out. Uh, her LinkedIn group is probably one of the best things out there. Is uh, over a hundred thousand members and people proactively give answers to QuickBooks and technical questions. So go to uh, LinkedIn and search for successful QuickBooks consultants or go to the URL on the screen. And um, myself, I work and live in Miami, Florida. I teach QuickBooks in my own classroom in, in Miami. I love teaching QuickBooks. That's my thing. Uh, there's my website. Uh, we do CPE uh, training for our CPAs in South Florida as well. Um, I have a master's in taxation and finance. And uh, I'm a CPA and member of an Intuit Trainer Writer Network. So uh, pending that Michelle Long could actually make it somehow, uh, we'll probably not do QBO topics because I wasn't prepared for QBO topics. So everything here is going to be QuickBooks desktop topics. So people that don't use QuickBooks desktop, you may not want to. Uh, uh, you may want to learn something from here, or just uh, set the expectation that I may not have time to jump into QBO. I'm going to cover uh, some pretty popular, I'm not going to say popular, but some pretty common end of the year topics uh, that have to do with most of the times correcting my client's QuickBooks files. Okay? For the most part, uh, when the accountant has complete 100% control over the QuickBooks file, we don't deal with these issues. But when the client gives it to us, yes. Uh, so, so we're going to be covering things like Oh, uh, uh, an open balance on accounts receivable or accounts payable in a cash basis balance sheet this is something that drives people insane. So I'm going to try to walk through all the different things um, that, that cost that. Then I'm also going to talk about undeposited funds and, and working with uncleared undeposited funds. And um, I didn't prep a file, so I'm going to be working with a sample file and we'll probably be creating the transactions that cost these this, this issues on the go. And the last part is I have a special guest. Um, a friend of mine from a company called Money Thumb, who developed an application called 2QBO Convert Pro that I've been using for about a year or so. It's really, really neat. It can take CV, CSV files uh, or Excel files and convert them into .QBO. Um, so you can import them into QuickBooks. Great uh, end of the year. And it also has a, a, a module that can import most of the major banks, uh, PDF uh, bank statements, uh, convert them into .QBO. So, I put their QBO, I really meant to put, to say dot QBO, and I'll put in parentheses here, Web Connect, because I'm not talking about QuickBooks Online, I'm talking about the file format dot uh, QBO. All right, so uh, for the, you guys are, are, are new here today, uh, the QB Power Hour basically runs every two weeks. Next webinar will be February 5th, in the next two weeks. We do mostly tips and tricks and advanced insights related to QuickBooks directly. Uh, uh, the, okay, one thing, uh, most users, uh, actually all users are muted. I'm getting some comments saying, why am I muted? This is a one-way webinar, right? I talk, you listen. <laughs> we don't open uh, the voice over to the attendees because we have over 500 attendees, so it's impossible to manage the background noise of, of, of having people unmuted. So everybody is muted except for me. Um, anyway, uh, we usually do about 50%, that's about 50% QB online. Michelle and I agreed that she was going to do the QB uh, online and I was going to do desktop. And when she's not available, this, this, this webinar tends to be a little bit more uh, QuickBooks desktop driven. However, I did see Michelle Long logging in, so I want to see if her audio is working. Hey, Michelle, are you on? It looks like she's trying to log in. That's, that's a good thing. Um, so uh, go to qbpowerhour.com to give us some feedback on, on specifically on the topics that you want. Uh, during November and December, the most popular common theme uh, for what people were asking us to do uh, is year-end uh, related topics. So uh, because year-end related topics was sort of the, the, the top thing that was uh, requested. It's a little bit of a conflict because there's a value pricing webinar doing at that time, so we'll figure out if we can get around that. We'll see. Um, CPE process, uh, we have not issued we have not issued CPEs for the previous one. I apologize, it's tax season, so it's really, really heavy for us. 
if as long as you attend at least 50 minutes, you, pro you give us the correct CPE password and you registered and we use the email that you registered originally. And uh, at the end of the day, we, we have a spreadsheet with everybody and we batch send all those CPE certificates. Okay, um, so I wanted to clarify, next week it's also going to be end of the year topics. I know I'm getting some comments here saying, why don't we get uh, the topics in an email before we announce the meeting? So I'm announcing it right now. Next next week, next, uh, next two weeks, February 5th, is also going to be year-end topics. A couple of important announcements. There's a, a new webinar series uh, called, uh, I think it's called Value Pricing or Fixed Pricing or something like that from Ron Baker. It's a four-part webinar. Uh, you can go to Intuit Academy. It's free. I strongly suggest that Ron Baker is one of the most influential minds of the, of the value pricing world. So I strongly recommend that you look into that. Uh, the other uh, thing I want to show you, uh, we, we were testing it for the last couple of weeks or so, is uh, a new QB Hour app. So I'm going to kind of just launch here uh, an emulator that I have to give you an idea exactly what that looks like. So if you go to the, uh, the iOS store, you go to the Apple store in your iPhone or the uh, Google Play store in your, in your Android, you, you're going to be able to download the QB Power Hour app. It's free. Okay? It doesn't have any in-app purchases, so we're not trying to get anything out of you. Um, but what we like to do from the, from, you know, from the purpose of having the app um, is to have a central location where you can watch previous videos. So if you click on, for example, the videos uh, button there, it's going to have a link to all the YouTube videos for our previous recorded webinars. So that's a, a really easy place for you to watch the previous recorded webinars. Also, if you click on a blog, you will see all the blog articles that I write and Michelle writes. So we'll try to aggregate both Michelle and my articles into this QB Power Hour app. So it, it could be something that maybe every day or every two days you click on blog and you see uh, you know, things that we're writing and some things may be interesting. Uh, to you guys. If you go here where it says uh, register, it will take you to a registration page. I, I can't do it on the, on the emulation app. It will take you to the registration page, which if any of you are logged in and listening right now live, you don't need to do that because you are already registered. Everybody is permanently registered. Um, okay, so that's what I wanted to show you guys. I recommend that, that you look apart. All right, so that's it for the app. So all you have to do is search Michelle Long or Hector Garcia or QB Power Hour on the iOS store or the Google Play Store, and you'll be able to see that app. Okay? All right. So let's jump in now into what I'm going to cover. So the first thing I want to cover is AR and AP balances in cash basis balance sheet. So one of the articles that we wrote, um, not that, we, that I wrote, some that I rewrote that I took from Intuit's original article in, in, their, in their knowledge base. So I basically just reworded a couple of things here and, and posted here. It actually walks you through the four areas where you can have issues on your balance sheet. So if you pull a cash basis balance sheet, in theory, you should see no accounts receivable and no accounts payable. In theory, right? Cash basis balance sheet should have no accounts receivable and no accounts payable. However, in QuickBooks, because of how the database works and how things are structured, there are certain transactions that they're all listed here on this article. So look, look into it one by one. So I'm going to show you examples of a couple of these that actually caused that issue to happen. So I'm going to jump into QuickBooks now, jump into my trusted QuickBooks test up here, and I'm going to show you a, a cash basis balance sheet. So I'm going to open QuickBooks, hold on a second. There we go. Okay, so I have a cash basis balance sheet up. And the most important premise here where I uh, need to frame around what's going on here is that generally there should be no accounts receivable and no accounts payable in a cash basis balance sheet. Let me make sure everybody agrees with me on that. However, there are certain transactions that will cause this problem to happen. Okay, one of them is to receive a payment for an invoice in the future. So I'll give you, an, I'll show you an example. So I'm going to go to customers here, and I'm going to go to transactions. I'm going to click on invoices, and I'm just going to take a look at the invoices that are dated this year. Because okay? on the balance sheet we had open, we were sort of focusing on last year. So I'm going to take a look at any invoices that are dated this year, and I'll take a look at, for example, this one. 
so this invoice is dated 2019, and when we did last year on the sample file, we're talking about 2018. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to receive a payment to this invoice. I'm going to receive a payment to this invoice using the previous year, 2018. So I'm going to go to Customers, Receive Payments, and then I'll receive a payment, I don't know, 5000 Make it very easy, very clear. I'm going to unapply it here for a second just to kind of show you. And I'm going to date this some point in 2018. Okay, so so the payment itself lands into QuickBooks on that previous year, but the invoice related to it is for a future year. So what that's going to cost? Hit yes here. So when I go back to my cash basis balance sheet, you're going to see now I'm going to have negative accounts receivable. So that's the number one reason for negative accounts receivable on actually both a cash basis and an accrual basis balance sheet. So as you're troubleshooting this, uh, you may want to take a look at what specific invoices are causing this problem. Now, if I double click on this number, right, and then I want to make sure I'm looking at here multiple years here. So if I double click on that number, um, typically the report itself, let me just, uh, the report itself, in this particular case, it's easy because I'm going to make the font smaller because it's hard for me to work, I'm trying to make it easier for people on the webinar, but the font is difficult. So typically when I look at a report like this, um, in, in the real world, you, you're not going to have just one item there showing up and telling you, okay, this is the one item that has the problem. So there's, there's multiple techniques that we can use to identify and pinpoint the issues here. Um, in this particular case, I'm going to change, uh, I'm going to add something to this report that makes things a little bit more difficult. So I'm going to double click on this payment and I'm actually going to apply it. So I'm going to take a payment for 5000 for the previous year belonging to a, an invoice of the following year and I'm going to apply it. In theory, the way QuickBooks works is as long as I have an applied payment, a cash basis report will modify the financial statement and it will create that income based on the payment date. But there's an exception to the rule here is if the payment is before the invoice date, then that, that new payment date is actually going to be applied as the actual invoice date. So, so in, in cash basis, if the payment is in the future, the income gets pushed to the future. But if the income is in the past, the income gets pushed to the actual original invoice date. So that's an, that's an important concept uh, to keep in mind. Now, so that's one of the things that causes negative accounts receivable in my balance sheet. Now let's talk about what will cost positive accounts receivable in a cash basis balance sheet. So I'm going to do an example here. I'm going to create an invoice. So I'm going to go to customers, create invoice. And I'm going to create an invoice in 2018. So I'm going to leave a 2018 date there. I'll choose a sample client here, Hector. It will be my sample client here, Hector. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to invoice him a service item. Okay. So I'm going to grab any of my service items, like uh, custom work, labor, something like that. I'm going to take my service item, and then I'm going to make this $12,000. So if I invoice something in 2018, and it's not paid, and I'm pulling a cash basis balance sheet, the question is, are you expecting to see accounts receivable? Yes or no? And, and, and you, can, uh, you can answer these if you want to via the chat, if you want to give me some feedback. So are we, are we uh, expecting to see $12,000 in our cash basis balance sheet uh, in this particular case? So the answer is no. So I'm going to hit save and close. And I look at my balance sheet. The answer is no. However, this is the, the trick behind sort of this problem is if that invoice, I'm going to go back and I'm just going to search the invoice here real quick. If that invoice contains, in this case, an inventory part, an inventory part. So the invoice contains an inventory part. So I'm going to change this from custom work to some sort of, some sort of inventory part in here. So I'll pick this one here. Let me just double check and pick an item that we have in stock, because that will take us into a whole other issue here. So let me just make sure I pick an item that we have in stock. So let me just... Uh, look for something I have in stock. So I'm going to go to reports, inventory. Where's my inventory? 
uh, my inventory is not here for some reason. That's, that's strange. For some reason, uh, the report inventory report not there. Okay, I'll just pick this one that has inventory part and hope that I have it in stock. So I'm going to sell this inventory part for twelve thousand dollars. Just uh, put here twelve thousand. So the difference that we did from the first uh, option is first we um, we went to uh, a, a service item. The service item did not post my accounts receivable, but my inventory item did post my accounts receivable. So this really strange thing happened. My accounts receivable used to be negative 5,000. Now it's negative 4,968. Why is this happening? If I double click and inspect on this accounts receivable, make the font a little bit smaller here. If I double click and inspect it, I see my original 5,000 that is causing a problem, and now I see a real random number, 32. So $32 affected my accounts receivable. Does anybody want to guess through the chat or a question, why is this strange number like $32 showing up in my accounts receivable in my cash basis balance sheet? Anybody want to guess? Exactly. So, so somebody said cost of goods sold, somebody said cost of the item. So the issue is because there is a transfer of a transaction from from balance sheet to balance sheet. Basically, I'm moving, in this particular case, I'm moving the value of the inventory from cost of goods sold uh, into sales. Or I'm moving it away from something, right? I'm sorry, I'm, I'm moving it from inventory to cost of goods sold, sorry. I'm moving it from inventory to cost of goods sold because I'm affecting my balance sheet, then, then that accounts receivable needs to be affected. So whenever you have, whenever you have an accounts receivable transaction in a cash basis balance sheet, that is not paid, but is affecting a balance sheet item, you will still, you're still gonna see that affecting your accounts receivable. I'll give you another example here, which is peculiar. So I'm gonna grab here, I'm gonna create an item that affects a, a balance sheet of some sort. So I'm gonna come in here and then I'm gonna affect, let's see if I have some sort of uh, current asset or current liability here, customer deposit. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna grab, I'm gonna put here a deposit. So deposits okay so I'm gonna grab an item called deposit that affects my balance sheet and then I'm gonna put I'm gonna put here negative 4,000 so for whatever whatever reason the client had we had we adjusted this invoice to some sort of balance sheet account and I'll hit save and close and notice what happens okay and, and this is what's kind of insane about this so what ends up happening is is a Proportion, right? A, a proportion of that of that amount, and I'm just, I'm just uh, I don't think you guys can see the entire report here. So let me just uh, simplify it. So, so now what ends up happening is a proportion of that invoice, proportion of that invoice, uh, which is the thirty-two dollars and the four thousand dollars, are now affecting my accounts receivable in here uh, because it's affecting the balance sheet, and then uh, and then this other entry, which basically takes the proportion of the cost of the item, which is, this is really what, what makes things kind of tricky. So, so the proportion of the balance sheet, which in this case is 4,000 divided by 12,000, we're talking about two thirds. So the system is netting two thirds of the original cost of that product and it's posting it into the balance sheet. So it's kind of an interesting on how QuickBooks behaves. That's a very interesting uh, concept and it's important to understand it because when you're troubleshooting that, that, that number, you have to keep that into consideration. So what most people will do in this case is they'll come in here and they'll make a journal entry, uh, take away accounts receivable, right? So we'll debit accounts receivable and credit your sales, which is not entirely wrong. I think at the end of the year, it will probably be okay, you know, for, for more, most IRS type scenarios. But the problem you're having is that you're not correctly identifying the root cause of the problem. So, so because of that, it, it's very tricky or it's very uh, difficult to actually deal with a cash basis balance sheet. Okay, so kind of keep that in mind about that. Okay, um, all right. So let me go to accounts payable now and talk about accounts payable. So, still, this is a cash basis balance sheet, and I have an accounts payable amount. So let's talk about the two circumstances. One is a negative accounts payable, and two, a positive accounts payable. 
So something that would show a negative accounts payable, in this case, would be an unapplied bill payment. So I'm going to go to vendors, vendor center, and I'm going to go to transactions here, and I'm going to go to bill. I'm just going to look for a bill dated this year. So I'll just grab whatever bill that's still open. Do we even have any open bills right here, this one, Peacock. Okay. So I have a bill dated 2019, and I'm going to pay this bill, but as of 2018. So I'm going to go to, uh, in this case, vendors, pay bills, you know, date this 2018, perfect. And I look for the Peacock one, there you go. And this is 2018 still, I want to make sure that's clear, right? We're talking about a payment in 2018. So I'm making a payment in 2018, and in this case, it's applied, it's an applied payment. But when I go into my cash basis balance sheet, now I see that number, the 2,000 something, cost that number to go to negative, okay? So uh, an applied or unapplied, actually both, an applied or unapplied payment dated one year where the bill itself is dated in a future year is going to cost you to have negative accounts payable. Now if I double click on this 560, in this case, in this particular case, uh, in this report, things are being uh, just, it's just bringing it down to one transaction that is, that is causing the issue. But in, in real life, when you guys deal with this, in real life, you're gonna have tons of transactions uh, causing a, a problem here. So that's an important piece to, to keep in mind there as well. Uh, the other thing that would cause that accounts payable to go over would be a, a bill that contains inventory. So if I go to vendor, enter bills, and I contain a bill dated 2018, so we're still talking about, again, we're talking about a 2018 dated bill. And I'll select any, uh, I'll select any vendor here, and I select any account, like for example, uh, gas, and I'll put here $10,000. So in, in theory, if I save this bill, it will not affect my accounts payable, right? I think all of you guys will agree with that. So because this is a bill, it's open, it hasn't been paid, it will not affect my accounts payable. So I hit save and close. Not affecting my accounts payable, I just want to illustrate it by showing you on the balance sheet. Okay? But if I take that same bill, and instead of doing some sort of uh, 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 expense account, instead of doing that, I use an actual inventory part. I'm going to go back in here. I'm going to get rid of this thing. And instead of hitting the expense account, I'm going to hit an inventory part. And uh, let me just select any inventory part that's here. And this will be, whatever, 10000 And I'll hit save and close. We're going to go back into our balance sheet with an unpaid bill that had an inventory piece, and that cost the, the issue. Okay? So that is, in a nutshell, what causes a problem with negative or positive accounts receivable or accounts payable in the balance sheet when the balance sheet is cash basis. Um, Michelle, are you still on? Uh, I think you were waiting for me to kind of get into a break for you hey. to jump in. Are you still on? Hey, Hector, can you hear me better now? Yes, yeah, now we can hear you perfectly. So I'm going to put this on pause because I know you have to get back into the training, and I'll make you presenters so you do um, end-of-year tips on QBO. Oh, very good. Thank you, Hector. I'm sorry, everybody, for some of the technical difficulties. As he said, uh, I'm up here in Toronto today, and evidently the, the uh, Internet did not want to work in my room. Um, so I am getting the presentation um, pulled up here. Actually, I'm just going straight into PowerPoint. Um, so there we go. Show my screen. I'm going straight into QBO, not PowerPoint. Sorry about that. And I just wanted to share a few things for you this time. Um, as Hector mentioned, we can get more in-depth on some of these things a little bit later. Um, but a few key things when it comes to year-end. First of all, you know when you're in the reconciliation window. So right now I'm in the reconciliation area. Some things that you'll want to look for when you're starting to work with your client and clean up your end things. First of all, look and see if they made any changes to close or to reconcile transactions. So when you go into the reconcile window, you'll see this column where it says changes. If I click on that, it will show me at a glance what happened and what transaction was changed. So in this example, we have an expense here, and they changed the amount after we cleared it and reconciled it. So at a glance, you can go in and see when they changed um, transactions that have been cleared. 
you can find them and figure out what you need to do to fix them a lot quicker and a lot easier. Um, so use that change column. And then the other thing is when they force the bank reconciliation, you know the clients that do that, when they click reconcile now and it posts to reconciliation discrepancies, this will allow you to see this auto adjustment column is when they force that bank reconciliation. So you can see that at a glance and you would be able to undo if you need to do that. The other big tool that we have that we're going to use at year end is the reclassify transaction. When you're going in and you're finding and fixing mistakes that your clients have made, if you don't know about the reclassified transactions already, you really need to start using it. I know it's available in the desktop version um, under the accountant menu, and it's a client data review tool. It's also available in QuickBooks Online. So on the left side here, I can review what my client has in these various expense accounts. As I'm reviewing that, let's say, for example, here under fuel expense, Let's pretend that these were in the wrong account, and I'm just going to select two of them. You can select as many as you need. Now, keep in mind, when you have a client, they're going to have way more transactions than the sample company does. If you click on name and sort things by name, so you would group all the ones that are the same name together. Don't sort by date, because this is going to be easier to select the ones that are wrong select all of them, then down here at the very bottom, you want to click the box where it says change the account to, and I'm just going to put it to advertising. Now, I know that's not correct, but I just want to show you, instead of opening each one, changing the account, save and close, we very quickly can use this tool to not only review the activity in the accounts, but then reclassify it. So if I click on reclassify, we're going to take two of these, and we're going to move them over to the advertising expense account. So now you can see if I click on the left under advertising, you'll see there's the two gas and oil ones that I moved from fuel expense over here to advertising. So again, a few key things to remember. On the left is where you can review the activity in the various accounts, and you can change it to look at balance sheet accounts or P&L accounts, and you can go through and reclassify expenses or non-item based transactions. So see how it says up here, non-items? I'm going to talk about how you can change an item in just a minute. So this is when they post it to the wrong expense account, pretty much. Um, uh, you can go through and fix those things. Now, if you had class tracking turned on, you also, right down here in the bottom, you would see another line right here with a box, class 2, so you could assign a class or reclassify transaction. So not just changing what account it's posted to, but you can assign a class or fix and reclassify it using classes. You can't do that with the location tracking, only with the class tracking. So that's something that is important to keep in mind. But this tool can really save you a lot of time when your clients have things classified to the wrong accounts. The other thing that's very helpful is when the items might be mapped incorrectly. Now keep in mind, in the desktop version, it's called the items list. In QuickBooks Online, it's called our products and services. So I've already got this pulled up for us here under the products and services list. When you go through here, let's say I'm reviewing my account mappings to make sure that things were set up properly, they're mapped to the, the right accounts. So let's say I discover that something's wrong. So I'm just going to go into this design right here, and you'll see up here all the details for the design. If you scroll down to the income account here, if I wanted to change that, watch what happens here. Right now it just says it is taxable or not, but the minute I choose a different income account, so let's choose landscaping services, look what happens right here. Also update this account in historical transactions. So with the reclassified transactions, we can go through and do a bunch of them that's the wrong accounts, but you can't do an item-based reclassification. If you have items that are mapped to the wrong account, you can come in here, you change your account mapping, and then you can choose if you wanted to update historical transactions, but be careful. I, I don't think, I would have to test it to be 100% sure, but I'm pretty, pretty sure it will change them without regard to the closing date password. So in other words, if I have a closing date password, let's say I'm cleaning up 2014, and if I had a closing date password set for 2013, I don't think it applies. I think it will change all these transactions for all of the history. 
So be careful, you don't want to mess up your prior year information. So before you would do this, you know, double check, make sure, be careful. If you've got a new client and it's been wrong all year, then this is a great way to go ahead and update all of those transactions in one fell swoop, and it's going to save you a lot of time. Just be careful if you have prior years. Um, I would actually come in here and test it out in the sample company before you go do this in your real client files um, because it's easier to test things in the sample company. And I've told you all how to access that sample company before, so go in there and test it out, play with it, see how that works, but that will save you a lot of time when it comes to doing that. Now, speaking of um, closing date passwords, we do want to make sure we set that closing date. To do that, you go under your company settings, you click on the gear and under company settings, and I know a lot of people have said they can't find it, because they look under company where you see the accounting method, cash or accrual, I can turn on classes and location, and I don't see closing date. So people think it's not in there or they just don't see it, but it's actually on the advanced tab. You can get to it in a couple other ways, but here's the advanced tab, close the books. This is where you want to go through here and you can choose if you want to set a closing date. And you can choose, do you want to just give people a warning that you shouldn't do this? And I don't know about you, but sometimes that is not good enough. Usually you want to give them a warning and require a password. And this is where you can choose whether you want to give the password to the client or not. If you're going to give the client the password, make it a really good one. <laughs> I used to use Ask Michelle. So thinking that before they would make this change, they would call me and ask me, and that didn't work very good. They would just do it anyway. Now I use something like 500 bucks because if you make this change, it's going to cost at least 500 bucks for us to go in and fix it <laughs> so that they will think twice before they make changes to a closed period. That's the key. Make it 5,000. Yeah, there you go. Or some people just don't give that password to the clients at all. So that's up to you. And some people will change the closing date every month. Once they reconcile the bank accounts, they'll set a closing date. Once you've set a closing date, then you will have a report that's going to populate. But just like in the desktop version, it won't populate unless you set a closing date password. So in the reports, under our accountant reports, that's where you're going to find down here the exceptions to the closing date. In other words, you set a closing date password. They went in and they, they you set a closing date. They went in and they made some changes to transactions before that closed period. Um, so just be very careful um, with that aspect of things. Now, I only had time today to share a couple of key things with you um, getting into year end. We can get into a lot more details on troubleshooting and cleaning things up. Um, but there's one other thing I just want to mention today, um, and then I do want to go over it more in depth with you on another webinar. Under the accountant tools, which by the way, I am in the new QBOA. You know it's the new one because I have green over here. In the old QBOA, the old new one, the version two, you clicked on gear over here on the far left, just to the left is settings. That's where you would see the accountant tools, the reclassify transactions and things like that. But in the new QBOA, they've moved it up here to our little accountant toolbox. The so one thing I want to warn you about is under the write-off of invoices, and we can go through this more in depth at a later time, just be aware that if I come in here and I look for some invoices that are overdue and they're less than, let's say, $300, you know, and you can choose whatever you want, this is great to write off invoices in bulk. It'll do a batch write off for you unless sales taxes are involved. If you have sales tax payable, do not use this tool to write it off because it doesn't adjust the sales taxes. It will write them off for you, but you need to do a sales tax adjustment. So you actually need to create different items for a taxable write off and non taxable write off. So just be careful and keep that in mind. What I would suggest, if you do have sales taxes, join us on a future webinar, and I'll go over that some more, and we can use this report to give us a list. If you're just dealing with services, you don't have any sales taxes, no problem. You can select all of these, and in the bottom right, preview and write them off in one fell swoop. So it's a great tool when you don't have sales taxes. Otherwise, join me for another one, and we'll go over more in depth how to do the credit and write them off when you do have sales taxes. 
Um, but Hector, um, do you have any questions or anything specific? Oh wait, one more thing that I definitely want to cover is a lot of people are using QBO like they're using their client's login or they're logging in through QBO. They're not going through QBO A. You will not have these account and tools if you don't go through QBO A. So in order to make sure that your client shows up on your accountant dashboard and that you're logging in as the accountant, under the gear, click on Manage Users. Okay, under the gear, Manage Users, you can do this or your client can do this. You want to make sure you invite yourself as the accountant user. Then you get an email, you accept that invitation, and that's what's going to put it on your QBOA dashboard and allow you to log in through QBOA so you have these tools available to you. Um, so you need to be set up as the accountant user in order to be able to use these cool tools um, that we have available to us. Okay, if you click on invite accountant and nothing happens, because sometimes I'll have clients that say, well, I'm clicking it, but nothing's happening, then they're probably using IE, Internet Explorer, and a lot of things don't work right when you're using IE, or they have pop-ups blocked. If you look in the upper right corner up here on the URL box, you'll see some little image with a red X on it. They need to make sure and allow pop-ups, otherwise it's not going to be working quite correctly. But invite yourself as the accountant's user, so that you can use some of these tools um, to save you some time that you're in. Any quick questions, Hector, or anything else you want me to cover? Uh, no, I'm going to switch over to me so I can put the, the CPE question up. And um, okay. I'm going to ask you a question that, I, for some reason, is something I haven't been able to answer myself. They ask me all the time, you know, uh, and I just don't pay attention to it. But it's, it's kind of a very important question, and it's, it's one of the questions that is there. When you use the batch reclassified tool and you're working with a previously closed period, will it just let you do it or will it ask you for a password? I, keep, I think it just lets you do it, right? There's no protection when you're using that tool. Yes, I'm pretty sure that it will just do it. And the reason for that is they assume that accountants are supposed to be the ones using the reclassified transaction. When we're doing that, we usually are cleaning up the prior year, so a lot of times there is a closing date password, and they don't want to slow us down and have us put that in there all the time. So it will make changes and not ask you about the closing date. So that's another one of those that the closing date password doesn't apply, and it's not implemented there. Right. Okay. And uh, the, so the keyboard question is Mango. Write it down, because towards the end, right at the end, at the top of the hour, I'm going to put the question up. And we may even go a little bit longer today than an hour because we're doing a dem I'm going to dem demonstrate a piece of software that may take a little bit longer. It's, they were kind of our guest speaker, which is yeah, Ralph, the developer, is going to come on in the next couple of minutes to, to help me with that. Um, I, I, I'm personally helping him develop the software. So, so I've been using it for two years, and it's great. But I would love to get your feedback in terms of you know, how, how well it works. Um, the last question, Michelle, I think on the same uh, closing date password, if you change the item in QBO, and you change the item, and you put a little checkbox that says "Change Historical." Um, so it will do it. It will do the. It will do things beyond the closing date uh, as well. Correct? Yes, I'm pretty sure that it will change all historical transactions, um, not just like the current period. So that's where you have to be careful. If they have multiple years involved, you can mess up the prior years. So just be careful before you use that tool. Um, so I will let you do it. Okay, perfect. Yeah, All yeah. Right. And I see, I see another question in there about what is a QBO, QBOA URL to log in. We as accounting professionals should be logging in through, you can do office.intuit.com or you can do qboa.intuit.com. So either office.intuit.com or qboa.intuit.com. And thank you, guys. I'm so glad I was able to join you today. And I'll look forward to sharing some more tips and tricks with you um, on future webinars. But I'm going to turn it over to Hector and let you take it from here. Thank you, Michelle. All right. So I know Thanks, there's Hector. another webinar. Thank you. Bye-bye. There's another webinar at 1 o'clock um, right on top of the hour uh, about uh, the new changes to the Pro Advisor program run by, the, by, by Joe Woodard and, and his group. So right at 1 o'clock on the spot, I'm going to put the the keyboard question. I know some of you will probably jump into that webinar as well. I recommend it. Look it up. You, you could probably find it somewhere on the web. Um, all right. So I'm going to see if I can get uh, Ralph. Uh, he's the developer of the software. And I'm just going to keep him uh, on, on the voice because uh, I'll be able to give him some comments and stuff. 
Hey, Ralph, are, are you are you on? I'm here. Okay, perfect. Thank you, Ralph. Thanks for coming. Okay, so I want to show you um, this piece of software called 2QBO Convert Pro, and it works on the Mac, it works on the PC, is under 100 bucks, it's extremely inexpensive, and what it does is it can take a PDF bank statement. So we're looking at this PDF bank statement here on the screen, right? So let's say, for example, your client gives you this, this PDF that's on the screen here, um, they don't give you a .qbo file, they don't give you an Excel file, they don't give you a paper statement, they send you via email or in a USB drive, what they specifically send you was the original PDF made from the bank. And it has to be the original PDF made from the bank because um, as I go through this, some of you are gonna ask, hey, what's the difference between this and ScanWriter? And that's the major difference, that this tool works with the original bank PDF, it doesn't work with a, with a scanned version of the statement. But, so I have this statement, and the traditional way for me to do data entry, or I think most accounting firms, they will literally have a staff member sit there and actually enter each of these lines by hand, because we have no other digital way of inputting it into, into QuickBooks. But this software solves the problem. So I'm gonna run the, the software program here real quick. And um, it's called 2, 2QBO Convert Pro. Uh, there's, a, there's a free trial that allows you to test it. That, you know, if you're a skeptic whether it works or not, just download it and you can see how it works. And basically, um, I, I, I'm, I'm gonna go to uh, convert here, I don't know where my menu is. So I'm gonna click on convert, and I'm gonna pick the file that I want to convert. In this case, I'll pick the file here, which is uh, this one called February 12th, and I'll hit convert to QBO. But what I'll do is instead of hitting convert to QBO, I'm gonna click, click preview because it sort of gives me uh, an easy uh, to view uh, preview mode exactly of, of what's about to be converted. So what this, the software does is it grabs that PDF, it converts it into sort of this quasi spreadsheet format that, that you're seeing here. Um, at this point, you have a couple of uh, interesting uh, things you can do here. You can actually choose the mapping. So if for whatever reason the mapping is not right, you can actually say, well, this column is the date, that column is the amount, that column is the pay. Um, up here where it says set QuickBooks account info, that's a, a pretty uh, good one, a good option you have here because when you go import this information into QuickBooks and you do uh, the next month and the next month and the next month and so forth, okay, uh, you have to make sure that this account number is consistent because uh, QuickBooks will not, will detect it to be a different account and when you try to import it, it will think it's a different account altogether and it will force you to create a new account. However, so I make sure I'll put the routing number here I'll put the account number here. I choose the bank FID that also needs to be consistent, and, and I'll click OK. Now, in the event that some statements have negative as positive and positive as negative, we can click here where it says switch signs. So when you switch signs, it will count you know, anything that's uh, a, a debit as a credit and so forth. But I'm gonna keep it normal because it's actually not a switch signs type of transaction. So after I do this, I click on Create QBO, and, and don't be confused with QuickBooks Online. This is a .qbo file. So I'm gonna click on Create QBO, okay? And then I'll hit OK. And this particular, in this particular, uh, I'm just running a, uh, the, the trial, it will only do 10 transactions, but it will, it will be enough to illustrate. So I'm gonna uh, take this file here, which is that dot .qbo that was created, and I'm gonna load it into my QuickBooks. Now, this is interesting, I can load this into my QuickBooks desktop, I can load it into QuickBooks Online, and I can load it into QuickBooks Mac. So this is not a, uh, a software only made for a particular version of QuickBooks. As a matter of fact, 2QBO Convert doesn't talk to QuickBooks at all, doesn't even know that QuickBooks exists. For all it cares, all it's doing is preparing a .QBO file or a Web Connect file. So I'm gonna, my QuickBooks file, file, utilities, import, Web Connect files. I choose my Web Connect file, and for all of you that do online banking, you know what this is all about, right? You, you manually download your Web Connect file from your bank and you import it. But what, what this will do is, it will now take the information over to bank feed as if this bank was connected. Okay, so I'm gonna choose uh, an existing account here. I'll just create an account here. So I'll create an account called Chase. Now, that account number and FID and the routing number that we used previous it's what we need to be consistent next time I import the same exact bank statement because uh, if, if that number is different, QuickBooks will think it's a different account and it will not import into the same account. It will try to make you create a new account for that. 
So what I just did is I took a bank statement and I brought it into bank feed using that converter stuff. Now, again, if if your file had given you, if your client had given you, uh, in this case it was only uh, five transactions that came in because I'm on a demo, but or is it the correct account? Let me just make sure I'm on the correct account here. Oh, remember, it's a different right. right. Uh, so in the demo, only five transactions came in because it's a demo, but at least you can see how it works. But if the client had given you access to quick I mean, to Chase Online or Bank of America Online, you could download the QBO. You don't need it, right? If the client uh, gave you the .qbo files that they downloaded, they, you can use that. You don't need this, right? This is when you only have that PDF. The other thing I'll show you is another interesting piece of what the software can do, and this is where I personally uh, collaborated with, with Ralph because I told him I, I wanted the software to do a little bit more, and, and you know, I will take your opinion on whether or not that's something you'd like to see. But when you're converting and you, and you pick the file, uh, what, I'm, what I'm also, let me just go here to preview mode, what I'm also uh, gi giving us a chance to do is, instead of going straight to creating a QBO, what I wanted is, I wanted to get uh, that step that goes before the QBO, so I'm gonna go back to convert, and which is created into CSV. So it will grab my PDF file, it will make a CSV, right? And I'm gonna open the CSV file here. It'll make a CSV, allows me, if I want to, it allows me to make changes to my CSV, in this case, let's say I want to I want to truncate some names, or I want to rename some things, and I want to sort of speed up my online banking process by making some changes here. Save the changes I did in Excel, and then come back into the software. And when I when I go convert, I pick the CSV file and create a QBO from there. So I like uh, the ability of being able to pull it into Excel, make some changes, and doing that. Okay, uh, Ralph, do you want to add something or comment something? Is something that I missed? No, I think you did a great job. <laughs> okay. um, so there's a couple questions here. Um, somebody's saying, how does it compare to Ledger Sync? So are you, um, are you familiar with this program called Ledger Sync? Uh, no, actually I'm not, sorry. Okay. Um, also, um, the, 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 so I twisted your arm into doing something, special pricing for this software. What, uh, what have you done? What did you do for the crowd here? Because I told you that I'm going to have a big crowd here. And some people are going to like this. So what, what did you do for us? Well, we uh, came up with a uh, $40 coupon, which is uh, about more than 30% off the, uh, the list price. And that's just for uh, seminar attendees. Um, and I should have the name. That it's, what is it, QB? Yeah, I'm going to put it up. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put it up in, in the website. And I'm looking at, while I'm doing this, I'm also looking at some of the questions because there are some interesting questions here. So they go to moneythumb.com, right? Moneythumb.com, and uh, in there somewhere is the, the software. It's, uh, it should be here under financial converters. And you go to convert to QuickBooks, and it's called 2QBO Convert. And then when you go uh, purchase it, uh, here it is, 2QBO Convert Pro. And first of all, for everybody that thinks this is interesting, download the trial, okay? Try it with your bank, make sure it works, okay? Bottom line, you should go and download the trial. But when you go purchase it, we'll use uh, that coupon code called, I'm going to put it up on the screen here. And does that have an expiration? I, I, we didn't talk about that, but is there an expiration on that? I um, believe this one expires at the end of January. Okay. So this is going to be QBPH40. That's the coupon code. And that gives you uh, $40 off. And the software is uh, moneythumb.com. Okay, so it's called two cube. Two, uh, I, I I suggest that at least at the very least um, you download the trial and try it. Now, not every bank works there. Correct? Not every bank works there. So, um, why would you say in terms of uh, the banks that work or that don't work that that sort of thing? Well, the, the first of all, the software has been tested with every major bank in the United States, probably close to 100 banks worldwide. It's designed to work with banks that it hasn't seen before, but you know, obviously, some bank that is, you know, small regional bank might do something really funky that we've never seen. So that's why we advise you to test it. We have found very few statements that we can't handle. Uh, sometimes we need to tweak the translator, and in that case, um, you know, we have a process where you can remove the account information and so forth and send it to us, and we can fix it. Okay. So, so you are you are open to 
if for whatever reason somebody has a strange bank statement, it's on, on the original PDF. It can be scanned uh, to receive it, right, uh, and then have people sort of uh, try to see if you can get it to work in their software, right? right? I mean, there are some, there are very few banks that we've found that uh, do some kind of internal encryption of their PDF files that we can't get around, but it's like, you know, 0.1% or something like that of the things that we've seen. And the software is $100 lifetime, right? You don't have to pay a annual That's right. Is that a service? Okay. Are you considering moving this to a service subscription? We probably will at some point, but you can get in on it now and uh, get it for lifetime. Okay. So people are asking about does it work in Canada? So the, it, it will work in QuickBooks, the Canadian version of QuickBooks, because it can download to QBO. Um, however, um, we I don't know if the bank statements themselves will work because we, you haven't tested all the Canadian oh, banks. It works with the major banks like uh, Bank of, World Bank of Canada and uh, Bank of Montreal. Uh, we also you know, hook in with the Canadian version of QuickBooks and use the appropriate bank list from the Canadian version. Correct, correct. Now, um, the other thing I'll tell you is you, you do have other converters in, in your website too, right? So there's a whole bunch of converters there, so you, you want to take a look at uh, those. but. The, the the one tool that we are that the one tool so you have one the, your original tool which is called PDF to QBO um, just did that one function of, of taking the PDF statement and converting it to dot QBO uh, this tool that we worked on together it was my suggestion that we have the ability to convert to CSV and QBO because I liked uh, being able to convert that so I'll I'll, I'll welcome some of if you guys want to email me or send me some feedback in terms of what you think. Uh, that works. Now that license is for one computer, right? It's not for you to install it in, the, in, in a bunch of computers. So it's just one computer, correct? It's the way the license is worded, it's for one person. So if you have so you want to install it on your laptop and your desktop, that's fine. But if you want to buy it for your, you know, multiple people in your office, it's multiple licenses. Okay. Okay. And uh, something I'm getting some questions about comparing it with ScanWriter, and I know maybe Ralph, you're not in the best position to make a comparison because in one way or the other it is a competing software. So ScanWriter is another software, it obviously costs a lot more, but it's more comprehensive and it works with scan statements. So if somebody gives you paper statements and they scan them, you would use a software called ScanWriter, which I use as well for certain scenarios. But if you're getting the PDF original statement or if you're getting a CSV, I have, I have so many clients that download a CSV or their QuickBooks and that them themselves sit there and do accounting, quote unquote. So they sit there and put their auto expense and they'll put their uh, transfer to whoever, to my cousin or whatever. Uh, so, so some of the clients actually go, in, go into their actual Excel that they get from the bank and actually type information in there. Um, so we can actually use a CSV or an Excel file that a client gave us and convert it to .qbo from here um, because, uh, because it doesn't, right, it, it's, it's not an issue. And, and that memo, we can bring it in when we do the conversion. Okay, and I do so much data conversion that this is something that you deal with every day. But when we when we bring in we we'll bring in a CSV file and we preview it, if your client gave you a memo, we can add that in there, and then that memo will come in it, when the down the transactions are being downloaded. So you can keep some of the original wording uh, from your client. Okay, this works on any local computer, PC, Mac. Um, and um, in, in the computer that you do it locally, it will output a .qbo file. So if you need to um, export it, send it to a, a, somebody, people are asking about hosting service. If it's hosted or whatever, it, it doesn't matter. Okay, I'm going to launch uh, the polling question and uh, for the CPE, and um, I'll try to stay a little bit on so I can answer some other questions, maybe about some other things. So I'm going to launch the polling question for the people that need to log out and go to another webinar. Um, yeah, so some people are asking, uh, does, does, can it be a scan version? Does it have to be the actual PDF that the, the bank gives you? The answer is yes. It needs to be the actual PDF the bank gives you, the original PDF. Why is that, Ralph? Do you have any explanation on that? Uh, we found that when you start to scan things, no matter how good a scanner you have, you end up with some characters that just don't make it through. You get fives that turn into S's and periods that disappear and things like that. And it, the, the accuracy just isn't there. Okay. Yeah, so it has to do with, with how it, it does the OCR, correct? How it does the OCR, how, we, how it reads that. 
Uh, we don't currently do OCR, and we've even we have some customers who have taken very high quality OCRs, and it does work with them, but they have to do a, a lot of checking and a fair amount of cleanup. Right, and, um, and, and this would be interesting for you to hear, uh, Ralph. I don't know if how familiar you are with um, with with QuickBooks accountant tools, but I have a really good question from somebody. Somebody is saying, "Wait a second, I have QuickBooks accountant edition." and I have this tool called batch enter transactions. If I already had the data in Excel, for example, I can copy and paste it in here, and I wouldn't need to convert it to .qbo. So I think one of the questions is, uh, you know, what is the benefit of converting to this .qbo versus uh, doing a copy and paste from the CSV here? So first of all, assuming that you have a CSV file, uh, copy and pasting here, would, you could do it, and you wouldn't need a third-party software like this one. Uh, to be able to work it. However, the difference is that when I paste information in here, whatever the name of the payee is, I'm going to get, I'm going to be forced to create the vendor each time. Whereas when I work with uh, online banking, for example, so that's the benefit of bringing it through QBO, that if I work with online banking, for example, and I've done online banking in the past, or, or um, I have rules set up and, and that sort of thing, well, what happens is when I bring it through QBO, the benefit I have, I mean, through .qbo, the huge benefit I have is I bring it through bank seeds, and then I can do uh, bank rules, which means when I start getting vendors that look the same over and over and over, then they'll start uh, learning, right? So with QuickBooks Online, QuickBooks Desktop, any QuickBooks Mac, any version of QuickBooks, you bring it to online banking, and you get that ultimate benefit. So, so I'm still assuming that the, uh, the attendees, I'm still assuming that you understand bank seeds, and you know how bank feeds work. And what we're working is with clients that, uh, that are going to give us 12 months worth of information this tax season, and we don't want to hand key any of these transactions. So that's really the, the big important point is here. Um, so uh, that's it. That's all I'd like to say. Ralph, if you don't want to add anything else, if you can't, I can wrap up uh, the, the, the webinar now. Uh, what I'll do is I'll make sure that people know where they can go for feedback. So this is the website um, to look at the software. At the very least, download the demo. Download the trial. Make sure it works with your client's uh, files and stuff like that. But in our website, uh, QB Power Hour, I'll just show you, it's important that you know that all of my blog postings and Michelle's blog postings are, they go, come in here. The one about AR and AP balances, are, it's included here, so I recommend you look at it. Um, we have webinar archive. That's going to be where all the previous webinars are recorded into, so we're going to uh, post them, we're going to post them up here, and that's, and that's pretty much about it. So I want to make sure that you come in here and you go to suggest a topic if you haven't received one. Be patient. You will get your CP certificate for the previous webinar in the next week or so, um, and um, if you're missing CPs for previews, the correct place to request them is, is there. Um, that's it. Uh, I'm trying to go to the questions to see if there's any other comments. Uh, try the software out uh, for free. And uh, email me if you have any questions. I have a couple articles on my website, a couple walkthroughs on how to use that software. So if you go to my website, uh, for example, qbblog.com, this is my website, qbblog.com, and you search in there uh, something like PVS to QBO or something like that uh, in, in the search. There's a, I wrote a couple of articles and sort of a walkthrough on how the software works because um, I've been using it for a, for a couple of years or so, and it's been – very, very useful. So I actually have a, uh, a walkthrough in, in the website, you know, basically step by step what the software looks like. And uh, you're welcome to check it out also if you want to see it in there. All right. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, let me pull up the last slide here, which is the SurveyMonkey link. So make sure you provide uh, feedback about uh, our webinars, about what you like to see, what you like, what you don't like. Uh, SurveyMonkey.com, there's the link in the screen. Thank you very much. I'll see you February 5th, and everybody have a great tax season.